everybody. Welcome back to AIT 1401. This is the second lecture uh, in our Introduction to Motor Controls, which is part of the basic electrical control uh, class. Um, we talked about electrical safety primarily in the first video, and uh, we talked about electrical shock, what it does to our body, how it, uh, how it does it to our body, as a, as a matter of fact. Uh, we talked about grounding issues and, and different uh, you know, uh, issues regarding safety when it comes to electricity. And like I said, the most prominent one is going to be your electrical shock that a person can experience. It can range everything from a, a tingling to sensation uh, to a fatality, and we talked about that as well. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, of the, uh, you might say, more violent uh, reactions when we're dealing with uh, electrical safety or, ele or electrical issues. Um, one of the first ones we're going to talk about is the electrical flash, okay? That's when uh, two, uh, one, one of the uh, three phases come in contact with another uh, phase, or if we have that one of the phases go directly to ground. And remember, we talked about uh, grounding in that first uh, lecture. But basically, you got three phases of voltage coming in, okay? And like I said, the industry runs off a of three phase voltage, and the majority of it is 480 volts. But regardless, you've got three phases of voltage coming in, okay? And in our schematic here, or our illustration, we've got a ground that's being uh, wherever our voltage is coming from in a, in a motor control center panel. Okay, it's being fed to our, um, our fuses and our contactor into our motor, motor to make it run. Well, we're also going to bring over a grounding conductor. And remember, this end of the grounding conductor over on the, in the motor control panel will be uh, eventually tied to a ground rod driven into the ground, okay? So that if we have uh, some type of a short uh, going to an enclosure or even our motor case, it will take it directly to ground and short it out so that it's not hot or live and we come up and we become the ground. We talked about that in the first lecture. But anyway, we got three phases of, of voltage coming over along with its ground conductor. And a phase-to-phase -phase short, short circuit is anytime one of these two phases come in contact with each other. Okay, it could be one and two, two and three, one and three, whatever. But it's a phase-to-phase -phase is when one of the two contacts, uh, one of the two phases come in contact with one another. Okay, and again, we're we're trying to get this electron flow to do some work for us uh, to convert that uh, electron flow into uh, some type of, of of work. In this case, we want to spin the rotor of this of this three-phase motor. But when we short circuit it. We don't have that load of our motor anymore in between these two phases, okay? So it's a short circuit, okay? Very, very high current, very, very fast, okay? And so what happens is you wind up with what's called, uh, you can wind up with what's called an arc blast. Now, uh, typically you'll have fuses that will take these shorts out really, really quick, but when you're dealing with a lot of current, um, and particularly in motor control centers, uh, you can have explosions, okay? Uh, and uh, an arc blast is an explosion of the air in the metal. So when we have an arc flash, if it's severe enough, okay, we will have molten metal, um, and you'll have uh, arc flashing going on, and all of that, it'll have sound waves, percussion coming out. So it's much more violent than just a flash. Flash is bad enough. I've got some videos that show um, these uh, arc flash and the arc blast uh, in this lesson. So make sure you watch those, and you'll see what I'm talking about as far as these violent explosions, but an arc blast is when, you, when it, uh, the molten metal comes flying out, uh, and again, you, got, you can rupture eardrums, that's probably the, the least that, that would happen to you, uh, but uh, here's a picture of one that actually happened, this is out of a video that is pretty graphic, um, and uh, it's, uh, this, this guy actually got killed, uh, but uh, this, is an arc, this is an arc blast, and you can see the molten metal coming out, and the flash, and uh, fortunately, he's, he is wearing uh, some protective Equipment. We're going to talk about that in a little bit too, but uh, that is a, the difference between an arc flash and an arc blast. But uh, you know, again, it's it's where three, uh, one of the phases come in contact with each other or goes directly to ground. Okay, uh, so when you're dealing with electrical cabinets, um, when you have to go into switch yards, when you have to go into motor control centers, which is where all of your three phases fed out of. Okay, fed, you're feeding it into the motor control center and it distributes it out on the plant uh, shop floor. To different um, equipment, uh, you're going to need as a minimum. Uh, you're going to have to have some a non-conductive hard hat. Back in the day, construction workers used to wear the, the silver tin, uh, you know, metal uh, hard hats. Okay, where they're conductive, and that's just not real smart. Okay, uh, you want a non-conductive hard hat. Okay, uh, you want to wear cloth 
clothing, okay? And when you've got something with uh, rayon or polyester or some of these other uh, man-made uh, materials, uh, even if it's woven into cotton, okay, uh, it becomes very hot and it melts as opposed to burning like cotton will burn. It will melt and actually melt into your skin. So they have found that cotton is the best uh, protective clothing to wear when you're dealing with uh, electrical equipment, okay? Uh, no jewelry. Jewelry is a conductor, okay? And you can get in there and get close to a piece of equipment, uh, or excuse me, close to a live conductor and bump it and not realize it. And again, that is the conductor and you become the ground rod, okay? You become the ground. So you're the path of least resistance. So you want to make sure not to wear the jewelry. And that includes necklaces too, uh, you know, earrings and things like that. Uh, a lot of companies have their own policies about that, but they're forbidden to be out on the shop floor. Uh, nowadays, you're seeing a lot of uh, people wear wedding rings that are made of rubber. Okay, rubber is an insulator, uh, so they still get to wear their wedding ring, but they also have uh, they also have their uh, protection uh, in place as well. Uh, safety shoes. Okay, uh, it's real important not only just for the steel toe, but also for the insulating value as well, and also safety glasses. Now, honestly, safety glasses are not going to do you a whole lot of good. Uh, with, with an arc blast like that, it's, it's, it, you will have a, a proper shield that you'll need to wear. And again, all this, uh, this PPE equipment is provided by the company, uh, or should be provided by the company that you work for. Also, hearing protection and non-conductive gloves. You'll see, particularly with extremely high voltages, um, linemen, uh, and also uh, people in working in switch yards where uh, extremely high voltages are, are present, they'll have the uh, insulated gloves. These gloves actually go through testing to uh, make sure that they uh, are, the resistance value is intact after they've been used for a certain period of time. They'll go through and they'll be recertified. If they don't pass the certification, they get pitched because you don't wear, want to wear a pair of gloves that's not going to uh, fully protect you. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk to you about, and this, again, this is rolling all the safety together, is the lockout tagout program, okay, or lock, lockout tagout. What is a lockout tagout exactly? Well. The lockout is the act of removing uh, stored or potential energy uh, in a system by placing, physically placing a lock on the machine so that that energy cannot be restored unless that lock is removed, okay? So that is a lockout, okay? Now, a tagout is simply placing a visual warning uh, that alerts people or anybody around, maybe operators or anybody else that's coming into the area, that that equipment is not to be operated. Okay, it is simply a, a, a paper tag. I've got one right here. Okay, now this is just a just a plain tag. Uh, it says "Do not operate equipment," uh, and it's got the person's name and things like that. We're going to talk about in just a minute. But this is just a tag that could be zip tied. Uh, that could be zip tied onto the disconnect. Okay, and that is not a good way to lock in anything else. As a matter of fact, it is not an acceptable uh, practice. Okay, so each man, you know, when you go to work for someone, um, the company is going to have its own lockout tagout procedure, uh, and it should there should be one for each piece of equipment or each system. Okay, and they will be developed and designed specifically for that company, specifically for that plant, and specifically for that piece of equipment. Okay, so it varies a lot. Okay, um, there may be um, specific. Uh, there may be, you may be working in a plant that doesn't really use compressed air. Okay, kind of hard to imagine, but I'm just using this as an example. Okay, so they're not going to train you on compressed air lockout. Okay, they're going to train you on lockout tagout for what's in their system. Okay, uh, or in their plant. Okay, uh, a lot of companies don't have chemicals, so there's there's different procedures about locking out valves that have. Uh, chlorine gases and, 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 and natural gas and things like that. So every company is going to have its own lockout tagout procedure it's required. Okay? Um, and they're going to do that training for you. So and again, this is not lockout tagout training. It's just familiarization with the concepts. Um, you will have to observe them while you're in the lab. But the organizations that you go to work for or that you are currently working for should have uh, specific training uh, for that. Okay? So when we're talking about lockout tagout, and again, we're, we're, we're speaking specifically about um, electrical lockout tagout. You've basically got a disconnect, okay? This is, this is a typical three-phase disconnect, and you're hanging your lock uh, on there so that when you try to raise that handle, it's physically locked in the off position, and it will not 
become de-energized unless someone removes that lock. Now I've got a typical lock right here, okay, just a little master pad lock, no big deal here. And this hasp is so that you can kind of gang lock it with some of your coworkers, some of your fellow technicians. You want to make sure that you, you wrap it around this handle right here. Now there's some there's a there's a lock right a little locking mechanism right here that keeps the door from being uh, opened up. That's not the one you want to put in. I've seen that happen a lot. They'll think they're locking the you're de-energizing and locking out. It goes in the handle. Okay, so uh, you got a lock, you got a hasp like this one right here. This one here could have a hasp, I should say. Hasp would go in there like that, and multiple locks can be hung on there. You have you have up to six. Uh, locks and I've seen uh, hasps go in here and have an additional six locks being able to lock out. But the most important thing is that you are in control of this lock. Okay, you've got the key, and uh, you, you maintain possession of that key at all times. You don't share a lock. You don't let you don't let your buddy use it. You don't let a supervisor uh, be in control of that lock. A lockout tagout program will, will designate a lock for you. Typically, they'll have your initials engraved on it, or maybe your uh, maybe your employee number stamped into the lock. Okay, and you've got a key, and you're the only one with the key uh, that has that. Otherwise, it has to be cut off. It's a big, long procedure to go through that. But you, this is used in combination with lockout tagout. Okay, and of course, the tag has the information as well. And like I said, the only person in control of your safety is you. Okay. You're the only person that can take that lock off, all right? And if that lock doesn't come off by you, then that means you're not done with the job and you it's not ready to be energized, okay? Now, there are cases where sometimes you get off work and you accidentally leave uh, and you have to leave a piece of equipment locked out, okay? Uh, sometimes there's repercussions for that. But I'll talk to you quickly about tag out, okay? Tag out basically has the information, uh, the name of the equipment that's locked out that's affected by the shutdown, okay? Um, the reason that it shut off or shut down or locked out or tagged out, excuse me, tagged out, the, per the person authorizing uh, the shutdown is typically a maintenance supervisor. Sometimes it's the technician himself. He can take that uh, in, in control of his own hands and he can do that. He's authorized to do that. The date and time of shut, shut down and the uh, individual that authorized that shutdown as well. Okay, so there's just a tag. And tags are easily removed. Again, I said earlier, you can put one on with a zip tie. It's great, but it does not provide a physical uh, barrier from that handle becoming, uh, you know, going up and becoming uh, the machine becoming energized again. So, uh, it, it does, like I said, it does not impede the, the uh, system or the machine from being re-energized. Okay, it's just basically information and a warning for somebody who's walking around the area. I want to know why is this machine run, not running? Why are these cabin doors open? Okay, you got a tag on there that gives you information need to use these together, okay? Uh, so this is not a tag out. I mean, not a lockout, excuse me. This is a tag out, not a lockout. It is not going to protect you. Uh, you use these together in concert, and there are a lot of different types of lockouts. Uh, and you know, we're talking about electricity. Here's one a special uh, circuit breaker lockout. You attach it to the circuit breaker, and no one can get over there and and re-energize that circuit, and you can hang your lock on it just like this. Again, it gives you sole control of energy going through that circuit or on that machine. Okay, um, this is one that's just basically got a, a uh, looks like about a 15 amp cord on the end of it. Okay, you lay it inside this uh, enclosure, you close the top lid, and then you lock the lock. Okay, so there's all kinds of uh, lockout tags. We've got some some of the round cans that you'll be working with in the lab as well. That will you can put the uh, plug that goes into the wall for three phase voltage, put it in there, lock it out, and then you, no one but you has that lock, and no one but you says when it can be energized or de-energized. Okay, or re-energized. Excuse me. Uh, and then I know this is electrical class, but um, you can also have. Uh, hydraulic valves, these ball valves are locked out by using mechanism to keep those locked out as well. Okay? Um, bond valves or gate valves, you know, you can, you can turn and open up gas on someone, you can open up uh, uh, a chemical um, or compressed air. Uh, a little lock like this, it just goes right around here, close it up like that, and you hang a lock on it. No one can get in there and turn the valve on and turn either water or some type of a chemical. Um, or some type of a gas or something like compressed air or something like that. They can't do that as long as that lock is on there. And you've got, so they've got all kinds of different devices for lockout, tagout, okay? But the, the 
one thing that you're going to have to do is observe the procedure. Now, uh, companies should have a procedure that you follow step by step on how to shut these things down. So you always want to refer to your written shutdown procedure and the, the uh, shutdown equipment using that procedure. Okay. So this is one that that's a, this is one that uh, I've seen before. Uh, this is an equipment isolation procedure. It gives the name of the company and the, and the system that we shut down, and it gives you step by step instructions. And these instructions should have been verified and validated. In other words, when it says to uh, shut off the uh, four-inch block valve, okay? You shut that valve off and you go over there and you can verify whether or not that valve shut an air, the air off or the gas off or something like that. Same thing with electrical. Uh, you can, you'll shut a, it'll tell you to shut a particular circuit breaker off or a certain disconnect, okay? It'll give you the label and it will match the label on the disconnect uh, or, the, or the motor control center. And those two will match up. And when you shut that off, you can know by this procedure that it should be shut off. Now notice I use the word should, okay? There's always the possibility of disconnects failing. Two of the knives of the three phase will come out, one will stay energized and you not realize it. I've seen that happen before. So that's why I say it should, uh, it should uh, shut the system down based on this, okay? So uh, you wanna isolate your energy source, okay? And standing to the right, and we're gonna, again, we're talking about three phase disconnects now. Uh, you want to stand to the right of your disconnect, okay, and you want to use your left hand and you want to look away to the right, okay, I've got one here, so if I am standing with my back here, and this is my disconnect, and I'm going to either de-energize or re-energize, but in this particular case we want to de-energize, I'm going to pull that handle down, I'm going to be standing to the left, and I'm going to be looking away, so that in case there is an arc flash, and again, I want you to go watch those videos that I've got posted, you'll see what happens right in front of that door. You don't want to be standing in front of that door because anything can happen. So you stand to the, to the right of the handle using your left hand and you're looking away to the right to protect your eyesight and also a flash coming directly out of that door, okay? So, now you heard me say a minute ago, it should isolate the energy source. You don't know that for sure. So you follow the procedure, you've done everything that piece of paper says, okay, and you trust the people that's done it. Well, sometimes, things can mechanically go wrong. In other words, you pull that, that three-phase disconnect right here and the three fingers that come out, okay, it's supposed to come out. Maybe one of them is, is uh, malfunctioned and only two came out. You still have a hot leg of power going into your cabinet. So that's where you pull your meter out and you pull the meter out and you verify that the voltage has been removed, okay, on all three legs or the control voltage or whatever it is you're testing uh, before you go to work on it, okay? So you gotta validate that yourself. Okay, because like I said, the, the, uh, the, the procedures could be perfect in what they're supposed to do, but there's always that chance of mechanical failure um, uh, or just some anomaly that will catch you uh, and it could hurt you or even kill you, okay? So, there's one other uh, thing that you've got to be uh, concerned about, and we don't have this in the lab, but um, I've, wor I've worked in several plants that have this, and it's called interlocking, okay? And basically, uh, you have to be careful as far as interlocked voltages coming into a panel that you're working in. All right. So here's here's a scenario I've kind of developed here for the slides here. Suppose you've got conveyor number one, and it's got a motor starter in here, and it goes out and runs that conveyor motor number one. But conveyor number two is dependent on conveyor number one's motor starter being energized before it can get voltage over to its system. So you're going to have uh, you're going to have basically hot voltage going from this panel into this one to this motor starter. Once the motor starter engages, it'll set, close a set of contacts and send the voltage over here saying, hey, conveyor number two can run, okay? This is known as interlocking voltage. Here's the problem, okay? So I've got this, I want to shut down conveyor number one to work on it, okay? I don't want to, I'm not messing with conveyor number two, but I need to shut down conveyor number one. I shut this down and I've, I'm, and in theory, I should be good to go. Everything in here in this panel is dead. No, I've got voltage being fed over here in this one. So I'm going in here working and I've got hot voltage right next to me. I may not be aware of it. Now, there should be, uh, a lot of times electrical uh, interlock voltage is wired in yellow. Uh, you need to refer to the National Electric Code. There's, there's variations of where there's AC, DC, things like that. But 
there should be it should be a separate uh, color and also that procedure should tell you even though you're just working on conveyor number one you also need to cut up shut down uh, conveyor number two's disconnect because it's feeding interlocking voltage over there so you, before you get in conveyor one don't just assume okay I got it locked out I'm good to go because there could be another alternate source of voltage going in entering this physically entering that cabinet that you're not aware of and you go to take that motor starter out you unconnect you connect the set of wires it's just kind of there and they've got hot voltage on them. So you become that ground, okay, and that conductor. So again, interlocking voltage is very important. Um, so you know, your procedure should tell you, make you aware, hey, you gotta make sure you can shut off conveyor number two, even though you're only working on conveyor one, okay? But again, always refer to the isolation procedures that should be provided for you, okay? And again, uh, the most important thing of all of this is being safe, okay? Uh, again, I've seen fatalities, uh, two of them, um, uh, I've seen some, some guys hurt really bad and burn badly uh, as a result of getting uh, you know, with, with electrical uh, systems. And uh, again, it's, it's not pretty. Uh, you want to observe the safe procedures at, you know, at all costs. You know? So again, um, just this is sort of wrapping up the first part, this first lesson as far as introduction. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You're going to be working in the lab and you're going to become familiar with the trainers. Again. Remember what we've, take, we've, we've talked about. That brings me to another point. You should be taking notes in all of these lectures, okay? Before you come to lab, you should be taking notes. Okay, this is a rather simple lesson here. The other ones, you will need to be prepared, okay? So, take notes in the lecture, in your reading, and all that. So, uh, but uh, that concludes the, the first lecture for uh, Introduction to Motor Controls. If there's anything you don't understand, something you want to talk about, uh, please just get a hold of me, email me, call me. Uh, swing by my office, you'll see me in the lab some. So just find me and we'll discuss whatever it is you need to understand, okay? We're more than glad to do that. For now, that's it, and we will see you in the lab. Thanks a lot.